Good afternoon and welcome to today's forum that will offer perspectives on ROTC at Columbia. I'm John Coatsworth, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs here at Columbia, and I'm delighted to see you all here. Today's forum is sponsored uh, by the Arnold Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies and jointly sponsored uh, with uh, the school itself, SIPA. As you know, the question whether Columbia should again play host to a formal reserve officers training corps program has become the subject of a lively debate uh, at the university. The university senate, which is composed of 108 elected and appointed members representing faculty, students, administrators, research officers, librarians, and alumni, appointed a task force to look into this question after repeal of the military's don't ask, don't tell policy. The task force conducted a poll among the more than 11,000 students enrolled in the five schools, including SIPA, whose students participated in off-campus ROTC programs in the past five years. Of that number, uh, 2,252 students registered their opinions, somewhat more than 9,000 did not, and of that number, 2,252, 60%, or a little over uh, 1,350, indicated approval of a return of ROTC to Columbia's campuses, and 79%, or 1,780, approved of Columbia allowing the participation of Columbia students in ROTC, whether on or off campus. We are fortunate uh, to have with us today Professor James Applegate, uh, who is a university senator and a member of the ROTC task force. And in a few moments, I'll ask him to say a few words about the process and where we are. The ROTC, <clears throat> as we know it today, was created by an act of Congress in 1916 as the United States prepared to enter World War I. Though earlier versions of this program had existed on college campuses in the United States as, from as early as 1819. Until the 1960s, many ROTC programs were obligatory for all male students at the campuses where they were located. Today, they are voluntary, with participants eligible for substantial scholarships. At present, there are 273 Reserve Officer Training Corps programs scattered among the country's nearly 4,000 institutions of higher education. ROTC graduates constitute 39% of all active duty officers in the U.S. Armed Forces. They are especially conspicuous in the Army, where some 50%, 56% of all officers are ROTC graduates. Though there is no ROTC program located on the Columbia campus today, Columbia students are able to participate via programs at Fordham uh, and St. John's. It is not clear uh, in the discussion so far uh, what investment the university would be uh, expected to make or would need to make in staff and facilities uh, if, a if a ROTC program were to be physically located on the campus. In my long career as a teacher, which as some of you suspect began in the dark ages, <clears throat> I have been deeply impressed by the courage, integrity, and idealism of two groups of students I have taught in particular. Those who have been willing to risk their lives to defend their country, and those who have been willing to risk their lives to change it for the better. That is why I am proud to report that 67 veteran um, and active duty U.S. military personnel are pursuing degrees at SIPA. In addition to veterans of several other countries, of the armed forces of other countries, who are also studying among us. SIPA's staff has worked hard to preserve the financial support our veteran students need to complete their studies. We have, for example, compensated for the recent cap placed on fellowship funding through the new GI Bill by expanding the funding SIPA provides through uh, the university's Yellow Ribbon Program. And I'm pleased to see that there are a number of members of the SIPA Veterans uh, Organization uh, here in the audience this afternoon. For our discussion today, we've invited four distinguished members of the university faculty 
who disagree, as our distinguished faculty often do, uh, on the ROTC issue. You will hear from SIPA and political science professor Richard Betts and sociology professor Alan Silver, who favor the return of ROTC to the Columbia campus, and from astronomy professor David Helfand and English professor Bruce Robbins, who oppose it. As they would be the first to tell you, the distribution of the disciplines they represent is entirely random with re respect to their perspectives. You should not infer that the social sciences favor while the humanities and sciences oppose ROTC. <clears throat> I will ask each of the speakers to summarize his views in eight to 10 uh, minutes and ruthlessly enforce this limit to leave ample time for questions <clears throat> and answers uh, after all have spoken. So let me begin by introducing Professor Applegate who will bring us up to date on the uh, process uh, and decision making of the University Senate. Uh, thank you very much, Dean's College of Perth. My name is uh, Jim Applegate. I'm a professor of astronomy and I was, I was a member of the task force in 2011 and I was the faculty co-chair of the Senate task force that considered the return of ROTC in the two, during the 2004-2005 academic year. Uh, as Dean Coates would mentioned, ROTC came to the Columbia campus during the 1920s. Uh, the program continued. We was, uh, and you should probably also know the ROTC and Columbia parted company in 1969 during the Vietnam War. The reconsideration of ROTC at Columbia began uh, in about 2003 as a student-led initiative. Uh, that initiative produced a proposal which landed in the University Senate. A task force was put together at that time and which considered the issue in 2004-2005. Um, there's a resolution that was, was drafted to um, suggest that Columbia should bring back ROTC. That resolution failed by a 53 to 10 vote. Uh, and the major issue uh, that was raised in opposition to ROTC was the Don't Ask, Don't Tell law. When Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed in December, the Senate was ready to reconsider the issue. The students had been pushing it pretty much every year uh, since the 2005 vote and been consistently told that they had to wait until Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. The task force that was put together uh, that has met during the semester was based on what was done in 2004, 2005. Um, the task force consisted of nine members. There was five students, including Scott Severance from SEPA. Uh, there was four faculty members. Uh, we were charged with essentially leading a discussion of ROTC. To that effect, um, there was three town hall meetings of about two hours, two plus hours each that were held, uh, the transcripts of which are available on the Senate website. There was an email address set up and we received about 120 emails. Those are publicly available as well. The task force produced a report uh, which is also available on the Senate website. Um, our conclusions, and quickly the most substantive conclusion the task force reached is that were ROTC to return to Columbia the conditions which were first laid down in the Mansfield Committee in 1969 and have been reaffirmed by every consideration of ROTC since then. We are now the fourth uh, in that Columbia would retain academic control over credit for courses, faculty titles and the like must be observed. Other than that, they did not recommend either pro or con. <coughs> Uh, the issue was, the report was presented to the University Senate on Friday, March 4th. There was some discussion there. There is a resolution being drafted by the Executive Committee. Uh, we expect it will be circulated fairly soon uh, for discussion. The next Senate plenary is April 1st, and we, may, we will probably vote on the resolution then, although, again, that's not clear. There's an April 29th plenary that serves as a fallback. But that's where they are. Thank you very much. Uh, our first speaker uh, in this uh, discussion will be Professor Silver. Americans generally celebrate the idea of the citizen soldier as expressing the democratic spirit, but the meaning of the citizen soldier has changed. In America's three big wars, conscription led to large militaries that reflected the nation. The all-volunteer force, which began in 1973, is imperfectly a, a citizen military, but not only because it constitutes only 1% of the population compared to the 12% that served in World War II. That 
is disproportionately drawn from a military cluster, a southern, the southern Midwest, non-urban, and increasingly, uh, people from families with histories of military service, of voluntary service. A great divide is widening between citizens who serve and others who do not. Today, I observe uh, with uh, the distance with which most Columbia students view ongoing wars. That's less true of students who inhabit this building. <coughs> They're not different from most of the nation's ed ed educated and privileged professional classes. And many consider the great Columbia uprising of 1968 as an exemplary protest against the Vietnam War. As a faculty member, I watched a student opposition uh, dwindle as the personal odds of being drafted had, uh, decreased for most uh, with the onset of a lottery system. Now, many Columbia students are not from privileged backgrounds. However, many who graduate from this and similar institutions will have acquired uh, comparative advantages, with exceptions. The advantage have little skin in the nation's military service and little contact with those who do. It ruptures the republic to have a military <coughs> composed of people that you have never known, indeed of people not known to anyone who you know. The officer corps is drawn disproportionately from less selective institutions and smaller colleges with a marked military culture. It is to such places and to other regions than the Northeast that ROTC programs were, uh, were withdrawn after Vietnam and the Cold War. There the military feels comfortable and more officers are recruited uh, less expensively. In regional terms, uh, the disparity is, is very large indeed. Uh, taken together, eight uh, southern states are 11.5% of the population but have almost a quarter of all ROTC students. New York, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, and Massachusetts have a little over 13% of the population and only a little over 3% of all ROT students. Embedded in those states are much of the Ivy League and other private selective institutions. America needs an officer corps exposed to, to the critical edge that Columbia and its peers offer. Now, it's true that these disproportions uh, reflect a long-term uh, differences in regional cultures, but they are uh, greatly exacerbated by the military's re uh, recoil from urban, cosmopolitan, and, and challenging uh, locations, and the reciprocal uh, distance that, that, that institutions like ours also take with respect to the military. Uh, to take but one example, uh, Virginia, with a population of 7.5 million, has, tw has 12 Army ROTC programs, while New York City, with, with a million more, has two. In an, in an ironic uh, collaboration, cosmopolitan civilian elites, actual and prospective, often feel that the good life uh, precludes uh, military service. Uh, which is honored at a vicarious distance. It's a civic scandal that those with greater prospects are egregiously underrepresented in military service. Uh, this damages the Republic because it weakens the ties that ought to bind. Uh, military service should be recognized at Columbia as a distinctive form of public service, one among the many voluntary activities that enrich students' lives and sustain a mix of perspectives <coughs> in our common life. We've been told that ROTC would militarize uh, the university. However, students in ROTC programs enter the military only after graduation. They are not subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, but have all the rights and obligations of other students. They take the same courses and major in the same subjects. What does distinguish ROT students is that their scholarships are contractual. In exchange for educational expenses and a stipend, they agree to serve as commissioned officers. 
And we've been told that this is exploitative and that any connection between the university and military service is incongruous, even if service follows graduation. However, this arrangement involves the exercise of legal agency by persons with the right and capacity to exercise that agency, and that agency deserves respect. And it is indefensible to preclude a student's uh, postgraduate plans in this instance when the, the university does not in any other. We've been told that the military is hierarchical and unquestioned and unquestioning and is, and is incompatible with academic values. Indeed, the military uh, differs uh, uh, profoundly from the academy. So in varying degrees do many other settings that our students enter after graduation. The world is not a campus. Uh, four decades ago, Columbia and other private institutions effectively barred ROTC in the passions of the Vietnam War <coughs> because the military uh, services uh, did not accept <coughs> full faculty control of curriculum, of credits, and the faculty status. These conditions still apply, and they're reasserted in the report of the Senate's task force. The ROTC Vital Vitalization Act of 1964 preempts faculty control of these vital aspects of university life. However, this law is actually waived by written agreements and customary practices. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology has three ROTC programs, but its catalog states that ROT subjects do not carry academic uh, credit at, at, MITC, at MIT, with the sole exception of physical education. Uh, Printon's uh, written agreement with its affiliated ROTC pr uh, program includes the clear understanding that credit would not be given, an agreement in place and adhered to by both parties for 37 years. At neither institution do commanding officers have professorial appointments. We have heard passionate expressions that the, that the, the university must not uh, lend itself to imperialist and unjust wars. Of course, the university is institutionally neutral with respect to public policy, but that formula does not capture the tensions that are intrinsic to our subject. Uh, American universities have long balanced uh, research, uh, teaching with multiple forms of public service. Not all agree on the legitimacy and, and worth of each form of public service. For some, uh, schools of business serve a wicked capitalism. For others, the schools of social work control the poor. For some, the humanities are enclaves of tenured radicals. For others, the considerable space that is afforded identity groups and the programs associated with them do not merit the respect. In some large part, the institutions which are, which are sponsoring this very discussion emerged in the Cold War addressing national interests through teaching and scholarship. None of these constituencies can properly, uh, can properly appropriate the whole institution for its purposes, ruling out others. They must live together, uh, sometimes tensely, uh, bound by a shared understanding that research and teaching, no matter how contested, is our common enterprise. An ROTC program and its opponents can live in this kind of comedy, Indeed, from their presence together, each may well learn something of great value from the other. Thank you. We will now hear from Professor Robbins. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I wasn't really eager to participate in this forum, I have to say. Uh, I have other things to do. But on the morning that uh, I... Um, agreed to participate. I, I read an article in the newspaper, I'm sure that many other people also read. The title is, NATO Helicopters Kill Nine Afghan Boys Collecting Firewood for Families. So I want to speak to the desirability of thinking about the ROTC question, not just in terms of the sociology of the American Army, not just in terms of diversity on campus or uh, respect for diversity or so on, um, 
sexual, <coughs> racial, and so on. Uh, I think that we need to ask ourselves uh, ethical questions about the US military from a viewpoint which is larger than that of our campus and from a viewpoint that is larger than that of our nation. Um, we will be told that the killing of the nine Afghan boys while they were out gathering firewood for their families was an accident. Uh, I personally believe it was an accident. Um, it is the sort of accident that is absolutely predictable if you put American soldiers in situations like the situation in Afghanistan. It has happened many times, things like it have happened, and it will happen many times again. It's worth considering, I think, how normal it seems that we do put American soldiers in places like Afghanistan. We not only occupy countries and uh, fight there, we have bases all around the country, all around the world. Um, I ask myself sometimes, why doesn't Brazil or Belgium or Belize have bases all around the world? Why don't all countries have bases on each other's territory? What is going on here that we take it as natural and normal that the United States should have its soldiers all around the world on the territory of other countries? And would we make that seem, which is really bizarre, would we make that seem more natural and normal or less by putting ROTC on our campus? Um, we will be told about the killing of the nine Afghan kids gathering fire, firewood that it's not representative of what the United States military does around the world. Um, I ask myself, what's representative? And I'm, I'm an English professor. I'm in the presence of social scientists who know a great deal more uh, than I do about this. It's one of the reasons I didn't really want to participate. But in for a penny, in for a pound. I look it up on, on the internet, you know, and I say, between 1890 and 1910, the US military was used 32, 33 times. Three of those were to break strikes in the United States. Three of those were to attack Native Americans in the United States. And all the rest, without exception, were invasions of other people's countries. That's batting a 1,000. Now, what's representative, people? Uh, at what point do you have to ask ethical questions about what it means to encourage a military that does things like that on a regular basis. Um, in my lifetime, what have I seen? I will leave out Vietnam. I am a, uh, the panel also pushed a generational button and I won't go into it, but this is sort of where I come from. So that's 57,000 Americans killed, everybody knows this, a million Vietnamese, we kind of say a million, and we don't really calculate a million. That's a million people. OK, I'm leaving that out. In my lifetime, the United States military occupied Lebanon in 1958, occupied Panama in 1958, invaded it again in 1989, occupied, occupied Laos, invaded the Dominican Republic. I leave out support for military dictators. Um, intervened against the rebels in Guatemala, bombed Cambodia, bombed Muslims in Lebanon, and invaded Grenada. That's not all of it. That's some of it. Um, I don't really care whether you call this imperialism or not. I don't want to argue, especially in the company of people who are much more expert than myself, what the name of it is. It's immoral, and it's illegal by international law and people in this country take it as natural and normal. We have a moral obligation to do everything we can to stop people from taking it as natural 
and normal. When I read my little list, you're going to have to stop me because I'm just going to go on and on and on. <laughs> when, I, if I'm, okay. when I read my little list, I left out the CIA. Different, not ROTC. Um, if I had been including the, the CIA, I would, of course, have included the overthrow of the democratically elected president of Iran in 1953, the same in Guatemala in 1954, the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961, the 1963 coup in Iraq that brought Saddam Hussein back to power, the coup in Indonesia in 65, and of course Allende in Chile in 1973. So here's a hypothetical for you, and it's addressed at the idea that I get, for example, from The Spectator in its editorial on the ROTC question, which is basically that let's not get ideological about this, which means let's not get ethical about it. Let's do a cost-benefit analysis, where cost-benefit analysis means we don't have to ask ethical questions. So what if it wasn't the military we were talking about? What if it was the CIA? That is, an organization that has consistently worked to overthrow democratically elected governments by violence. Would we proudly encourage the forming and training of CIA agents on our campus? Now, I have no doubt that we are actually training CIA agents on our campus. I would like to think we are not proud of it. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Would we say that it is entirely compatible with the mission of a university to train people to overthrow democratic, democratically elected governments by violence? Would we say, as the spectator has said, that we should not get ideological about this? Um, I think it's fair, I'm open to correction, to ask the kind of ethical question in this case that would be applicable to a South African, a white South African soldier who was enforcing apartheid. A French soldier who was enforcing the occupation of Algeria. An Israeli soldier right now who is enforcing the occupation of the West Bank. Uh, a Russian soldier who was occupying Afghanistan. Do we really believe that there was no relevant ethical question to be asked in those cases and that the only thing to ask was, what's a cost-benefit analysis of training people to do the things that those soldiers did? I almost vowed not to bring up the Nazis. I didn't quite vow to do it. I'll just say, since the Nuremberg trials, it seems to me that just doing your job or just following orders has not cut it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Betts. Well, I was uh, glad to see the announcement the other day that Harvard has reestablished Naval ROTC and is considering possible arrangements with the other two services. I just happened to be a graduate of the last class of Army ROTC at Harvard. Uh, uh, I joined as a senior in 1969 as the program was being terminated in response to the student revolt of that spring. Uh, and ironically, uh, getting into ROTC kept me from being drafted that summer and kept me out of Vietnam and enabled me to go to graduate school. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, the expulsion of ROTC from uh, number of elite universities at that time, I think, resulted in large part from anger about the Vietnam War and general revolutionary sentiment on campuses. Uh, today, uh, I think the objections uh, tend to be uh, somewhat uh, different, but I think a lot of arguments are based on confusion about what's really at issue. Uh, one fundamental misconception, in my view, is defining the question in terms of military engagement of the university, as some of the recent discussions have framed the issue. Uh, the military services are nothing but subordinate agencies of the United States government, uh, arms of the executive and legislative branches. The armed forces are mandated in the Constitution, and they're controlled, directed, and deployed by the elected leadership of the U.S. government. 
So if anything, the issue is larger than military engagement. It's government engagement by the university. Uh, I'd leave aside for our purposes concern about the academic status of ROTC, take for granted that uh, if reestablished, uh, it would be more or less an extracurricular activity facilitated by the university on the model of how it's done at MIT. And I'd leave aside the question of whether ROTC at Columbia makes economic sense for taxpayers, uh, since the unit here would probably enroll few participants. Personally, uh, I have some doubts, but uh, I think as a matter of principle, uh, if the government's willing to reestablish a program at Columbia, uh, we should not deny students the option to participate to become public servants through the standard organizational means that the government has established. To me, there are three logical grounds for opposing ROTC, uh, but none hold up except in terms of principles so extreme uh, that only radicals would endorse them. I think opposition makes sense if you believe one of three propositions. One, the United States should not have any military at all. Or two, uh, if American Armed Forces should exist, their middle management should not include Columbia graduates, but only graduates of military academies and ROTC programs of other universities. <coughs> or three, if armed services should exist and Columbia graduates should have the option to lead them, the university should not have anything to do with facilitating that option because the university should not be involved in educating personnel for institutions that sometimes do bad things, such as fight wars, many of us oppose, uh, or should just not be involved in servicing the U.S. government in general. Well, in regard to the first, uh, the proposition that American Armed Forces should not exist, I consider that a perfectly respectable position. But if and only if you're a consistent pacifist and believe that the United States should not have the capability to wage war under any circumstances, not for the American Revolution in the 1770s, not to defeat the Confederacy and free the slaves in the 1860s, not to liberate Europe from the Nazis in the 1940s, not for anything. Because if you want a military on the shelf for something sometime, you need to organize and maintain it constantly in peacetime. You can't gin it up overnight when something you suddenly want to use it for comes up. And many don't like uh, the idea of ROTC because they don't like some wars that the military has directed by the U.S. government to fight. Uh, for example, in Iraq since 2003. Uh, or the current war in Afghanistan. Uh, I opposed the war in Iraq, too, and I can tell you a non-trivial number of generals in the Army and the Marine Corps didn't believe it was a good thing to do either. But for better or worse, uh, the military don't get to pick their wars. They fight where and when President and Congress tell them to fight. The issue in regard to ROTC, uh, it seems to me, should not be the particular policies of the United States government at any one time, but the relationship of the university to government institutions over time. Uh, elected representatives of the people legislated the ROTC system as the principal mechanism for supplying junior military officers. And I think the percentages cited are even higher for junior officers uh, than for the officer corps as a whole. Uh, the issue to me is whether Columbia should enable students who want to participate in that standard system to do so or to refuse them that option here. Now, in regard to the second proposition I mentioned, if you do accept the need for the United States to have a military, impeding Columbia graduates from serving as officers in it uh, doesn't seem to me to make sense unless you have in mind some sort of caste system in which certain professions are the business of some social groups and not others, uh, and Columbia is in the exempt caste. The third proposition uh, is that the university should not be involved in providing services to institutions that sometimes act in ways uh, that some of us disapprove of, or should not uh, just be involved with government at all. Uh, that might make sense if you want a radical readjustment of university activity at many levels. Big chunks of, uh, chunks of Columbia train people for professions in the private sector whose activities are not morally valued by all others at Columbia. Uh, as Alan suggested uh, a short time ago, for example, we have a whole business school that staffs American capitalism, supplying leaders for corporations, banks, and Wall Street firms that don't always act in ways that we all consider good for children and other living things. Modern universities have been heavily engaged in providing services to the government for a long time in exchange for large amounts of funding. 
Uh, American taxpayers provide research grants and other funding, not out of disinterested love of learning for its own sake, but to develop and promote things uh, deemed to be in the public interest. Columbia could hypothetically stop servicing government and give up the funds it's accustomed to getting for such services, and the university would survive. It would just survive in much smaller form, or would not survive as we've come to know it. Uh, there are institutions of higher education that have done this, for swearing federal funding in order to maintain moral independence from the government, although the only one I can think of at the moment is Bob Jones University. Uh, finally, uh, one other objection I've heard recently, even though the don't ask, don't tell law has been repealed, uh, the military will still not accept transgender people, so uh, old grounds for opposing ROTC still apply. Uh, if that's a real reason, I can only reiterate that I think one should blame the U.S. government at the highest level, not the military as a subordinate agency that implements government policy. And by the logic uh, of the criticism about discrimination on grounds of sexual characteristics, it seems to me one would have to say that Colombia should not have cooperated in training military officers during World War II since the services at that time were racially segregated. Uh, and I doubt that very many people would believe that. Thank you. Professor Helfen. I'm going to take a complimentary tack uh, to my colleague, Bruce. To me, it seems much of the debate, including the debate here, but more of the debate in the uh, various publications by the Senate, by the commentary, and by the spectator, can, fails to distinguish between individuals and institutions. I at least certainly do not in any way object to Columbia students participating in ROTC. But that's a very different statement than saying I want the university to sponsor uh, an ROTC program. To me there's a fundamental disjuncture between the military culture and the university culture and between the military's mission and the university's mission in society. The abdication of independent thought and moral reflection and submission to authority while serving the institution, not as a person, but as an institutional member, that is represented by the military is to me fundamentally antithetical to the free and open inquiry that is the heart of what a university is. I would hasten to add that both are important, that one's not necessarily better than the other. Both cultures have very good reasons for the rules under which they operate, but it doesn't make them the same. Many of the problematic aspects of this debate that I see are, are summarized nicely in the, in the Senate's report. Uh, we can begin with the student survey. The fact that 11.4% of Barnard and Columbia students think we should have ROTC on campus is to me totally irrelevant to this debate. I, I hope we're not gonna move to a system of education by referendum. We'll end up in about the same shape that California is financially. Uh, furthermore, it seems to me highly inappropriate for the report to characterize this quote as a reflection of campus opinion. Campus opinion, the last time I looked, involved faculty members as well as students, and 11.4% is not a reflection of campus opinion. Secondly, the issue of discrimination. I'm going through the points in the report. Uh, while I abhor the blatant discrimination that the military has practiced, is practicing, and may practice somewhat less, I abhor equally the discrimination that many other institutions that Columbia regularly does business with and consorts with uh, practice as well, and this is not the basis of my objection, and I think it's particularly uh, weak to uh, go to the suggestion that, well, now, now they're going to let openly gay people serve in the military, but they're not gonna let transgender people, I mean, they're not gonna let two-year-olds serve either, that, that discrimination, I, I think that's a sort of silly argument. So let's put that one aside. It seems to me that many of the, much of the discussion has been suffused with an overweening arrogance about the enormous value of Columbia students. Uh, the report says that, that the Columbia students will be, quote, better, end quote, and will, quote, improve the military. I'm not so sure. I don't know how many people in this room have spent any time at West Point, but I have. Uh, in particular, I spent a couple years working with mathematicians at West Point, studying the curricular innovations that they have developed there. And I can assure you the education at West Point is far better than the education that takes place for undergraduates at Columbia. So it's not obvious to me that Columbia students have some unique contribution to improving the military. 
The report goes on to talk about opportunity and diversity. And it says that we could, it, having ROTC on campus could, quote, help attract more applicants to Columbia. Now this is sort of risible, right? We have 40,000 undergraduate applicants that we're going to reject. And I guess we could feel a little more smug if we rejected 42,000 applicants. But it doesn't seem to me like a particularly valid uh, reason. And as for financial considerations, if students or faculty, for that matter, are concerned about our scholarship awards, then they should spend their time protesting the early decision program, which admits nearly 50% of the Columbia students based on uh, affluent zip codes uh, rather than ability, and saves the financial aid uh, that they have paltry amounts left uh, for the other students. I think we could do a lot to put our own health in order rather than ask the military to fund our undergraduates. It says the military, quote, should be seen as a valid career option. I agree, the military should be seen as a valid career option, and it is a valid career option. But so should working for Goldman Sachs be considered a valid career option. And I would say it's sort of on ethical grounds, uh, the former is preferable to the latter. But because cause we say Goldman Sachs is not a, a, is, is an acceptable potential career option, doesn't mean that we should give Goldman Sachs space on campus, that we should invite Goldman Sachs partners to come and teach courses <coughs> of their design, uh, or that we should uh, accept students on the grounds that Goldman Sachs will pay for their uh, education as long as they work for Goldman Sachs for eight years following graduation. The only moderately good argument I've heard is from my colleague, Professor Applegate, which was just mentioned, is that last week Harvard invited ROTC back <laughs> to campus. And since we know that we have to follow uh, slavishly in Harvard's footsteps, whether it's mowing down 17 acres of the inner city to expand our campus or uh, have corporate salaries in our administration or uh, institute unsustainable financial aid programs because we have to do what Harvard does, uh, you won't be surprised to find that I find this argument somewhat less than compelling, uh, but at least it's consistent with Columbia's behavior over the last 50 years. <laughs> the preamble of the report uh, of the Senate which deals with history is certainly interesting, but I think it's largely irrelevant to this question also. Uh, the fact that 20% of the first class served in the French and Indian War and 45% of the class of 1861 served in the Civil War and that Columbia managed to produce 70 officers uh, for the Civil War. Uh, they, we managed to do all these things without an ROTC program, and I don't see any reason why we couldn't continue that in the future. I find it curious that this uh, history of Columbia's interaction with the mili military leaves out one of the more significant interactions as far as I'm concerned, uh, and that is the two-year tenure of General Dwight David Eisenhower, uh, Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in World War II, as president of this institution. I'm told, uh, by faculty members who are no longer with us, that his first faculty meeting, he got up to address, quote, employees of the university. And a senior member of the faculty stood up and said, excuse me, sir, but we are the university. I think that clash of cultures was obvious then, and it's equally obvious now. Both institutions, universities and military, are critical to a free society. Both institutions themselves and the society which they serve are, in my view, best served by keeping them separate. Thank you very much. Uh, the floor is now open for questions and, and uh, comments. There is a microphone in the middle aisle. Um, would you please, if you have a question or comment, step to the microphone, um, say your name, and uh, uh, give some indication of your affiliation if you choose to do so. And please keep your comment or question brief so that the panelists can respond. So let me begin with a question to the, those who are in favor of ROTC, and then I'll come back with a question for those who oppose it. Um, I was quite impressed, actually, by Professor Robin's long list of conflicts, not for the ethical reasons that he um, uh, raised, but for the following. If you count the Vietnam War as three wars, because actually Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia were all involved, uh, and you add the two invasions of Panama, the occupation of Santo Domingo and the Dominican Republic in 1965, the occupation of Grenada, uh, our misadventure in um, Somalia, peacekeeping in Bosnia, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and uh, the restoration of a democratic regime in Haiti uh, in 1994. Um, that adds up to 14 wars. Um, 
of those 14 to which we sent um, uh, a number of students of mine uh, and thousands of others, um, those who were responsible for the decisions um, that dispatched the troops to those theaters, uh, in five cases afterwards um, regretted it. Uh, or to use the words of um, Defense Secretary Gates, um, should have had their heads examined. And in the other, uh, and in another uh, several, um, perhaps too small to have elicited retrospective commentary from the decision makers, it's not clear that any issue of American national security was actually involved. The two invasions of Panama, for example, uh, or the occupation of, of, um, uh, of Grenada. Um, so my question to those who are in favor of ROTC is shouldn't we feel more responsibility uh, for our students than to make it easy for them uh, to uh, be sent on um, misadventures where they could get um, uh, terribly damaged or even killed when in many cases, if not most, if not all, um, the civilian leadership that is dispatching the U.S. military uh, uh, can be generally counted upon to make a mistake. Well, I don't have much to add uh, to my argument uh, that if you don't want the capability for the United States to wage war any time, then it uh, makes perfect sense to not have ROTC. Uh, but if you do, then that's a question of uh, policy that, that you've raised rather than a question of maintaining institutions over time that sometimes do uh, things we think are wrong and sometimes do things we think are very important. Uh, not much mention was made of World War II and uh, campaigns that I think many people who found a uh, number of the cases you mentioned uh, mistaken at best or abhorrent at worst uh, would approve of. Uh, and as a matter of uh, uh, institutional uh, development and maintenance, uh, you can't very well say you are all for one, uh, but because of the other, you don't want to do uh, whatever would facilitate the uh, development of the appropriate institutions. I, I think the difference between policies and institutions uh, is the main answer to your question. The responsibility is with the civilian elite and um, that's a question of citizenship, both on campus and, and off campus. And uh, m much of the, of the sentiment against, quote, uh, the military, uh, unquote, is, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I may borrow a, a Marxist term, um, uh, um, well, uh, forget about Marx, is misdirected. Um, I don't claim for a moment, and Professor Betts knows a lot more about this than I do, that the military elite, that uh, today um, uh, military elites don't um, engage in essentially political decision making in, in many respects, the, the old division of, of labor between the civilian authority and military <coughs> task has eroded. Uh, they, they permeate each other. There is a thing called the as Alfred Vax, a great historian of, uh, of the military and of militarism said, the great danger of the militarism uh, of the civilians. And as many people have, uh, have noted, uh, the, um, uh, the war, uh, our civilian elites have uh, in recent decades not participated nor have their sons and daughters participated. Uh, in military service. I, I think that indeed is part, of, is part of the problem. Just a quick note on World War II. Uh, I feel as passionately about uh, World War II as anybody I know. But I must say that I don't really, at this stage, accept the argument that because the, in the mythology of World War II, the United States played an exemplary role. Uh, that's the mythology as well. That, that that great experience somehow bears, as it were, endlessly upon the case 
that Professor uh, Betts and I are, are trying to make. That was the la so-called the last uh, good war. I, I think that uh, the, the, uh, there comes a time, and here I, I agree, at least in formal terms uh, uh, with Bruce, um, there comes a time when that shining moment is not <laughs> as relevant as it were, as, as what has happened since, let's say, 1948. Question? Comment? Yes. Sure, I have, I have both a question and comment. Austin Long, I'm a junior professor here at the School of International and Public Affairs. So first, the comment. Um, I probably have a different perspective on the academy and the military in that uh, I spend a good bit of my time working with the military in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, I was just in Afghanistan in January. I'll be back this summer. Um, they do a lot of things, the military. Um, certainly there are regrettable airstrikes. On the other hand, I spent a lot of time with young men and women who did not return fire when shot at for fear of harming civilians. So it's, it, it's a broad experience. Uh, and one of the commanders I worked with when I was there in January was a Columbia graduate. He managed to rise to a pretty senior rank without having been in ROTC since he graduated, I believe, in 87. Uh, so certainly a time when ROTC was not around. So I, I do think those who are opposed do have a point. You can, you can prosper in the military with having, without having been in ROTC. On the other hand, I think he's been an exemplary officer. And I think you know, encouraging students to at least take a look at those kind of things, uh, particularly in the way that it would be done here at Columbia if it resembles how MIT does it, and I did my PhD at MIT, so I have a pretty good idea of how they do it, uh, it is certainly a socially good thing. My, my question uh, is for David. Uh, you began and ended with the position that essentially the military and the academy are socially necessary, useful institutions, but, but somehow antithetical. Uh, yet somewhere in the middle, you asserted that West Point's education is superior at the undergraduate level to Columbia's, which seems to me to be uh, some sort of dissonance there. How can an institution that is orders of magnitude more militarized than Columbia could ever hope to be provide better education if these two things are so antithetical? Thank you. I, I guess I should have been a little more narrow in my comments about West Point. The education I was talking about was, and, and it's specifically in mathematics, but in general it is an education designed to an end. And the end is to be a superior officer in the service of the armed forces. Uh, the characterization that is better is that it is more thoughtful, more collaborative amongst the faculty, uh, and more effective in the classroom, at least by my observation of this particular thing. That's an institution with a purpose. And the sole purpose is to make excellent officers. And I think it carries out that purpose extremely well. This is an institution with a different purpose. This is an institution that is not a government institution. It is not associated with the military in any way or with any other operations, any other in, in independent institutions. It is essential that it is independent. That's an essential aspect of the core of the institution. And it is essential that it provide the education for the life of the mind and for the reflection, moral and otherwise, of the students who graduate from it so that when they go out into society, whether it's to be an officer in the military or to work for Goldman Sachs, uh, they have some larger sense of, of where they fit into the world and what their moral sensibilities have to be. And so while the education in mathematics, which I was talking about in particular, I believe is superior at West Point, the purpose of the institutions are fundamentally different. And I want to preserve that difference. Could I intervene with a question I was going to uh, I was going to ask the uh, the antis. Um, it seems to me that uh, one of the strongest arguments that's made by those who are in favor of bringing ROTC back is that uh, there's something about a liberal arts education that would um, m uh, help officers in the U.S. Armed Forces to deal with circumstances that they might find in the battlefield. I had a Harvard student uh, who signed up for the war in Afghanistan. By the time he got through. Uh, training, he was sent to Iraq, and his um, uh, not far from Baghdad, uh, his captain uh, pointed to a group of several hundred Iraqi prisoners, all with black bags over their heads, chained to a fence uh, out in the yard outside a jail that had cells for maybe 10 or 12 prisoners. Um, a captain who was very impatient to get on with his mission and assigned this second lieutenant fresh out of officer uh, training school 
uh, to take care of them. Um, and he did. Um, he did two things. He did what anybody else would have done, which was to find a sergeant uh, who had had some experience running a brig back uh, home, who seemed to know something about how to manage prisoners. And then the second thing he did was to pull out his laptop and Google the Geneva Convention. And I think those prisoners, as a result at least of the second of those two acts, um, which might have been helped by having a, a, the education that he received, perhaps different than he might have received elsewhere, um, probably saved lives. Uh, and it certainly meant that at least on this one occasion, um, the way in which tr prisoners were treated in that conflict uh, conformed to international norms. So shouldn't we have um, broadly educated um, people in the armed forces serving as officers? You know, I, I, I tend to agree with my colleague on the left. I think there is uh, uh, the argument, uh, some, some argu arguments for, for ROTC that I regard as, as, sh uh, as sheer snobbery. <laughs> it, in fact, even embarrassing. I mean, I'm a child of the Big Ten. <laughs> I went to Michigan. I, I taught at Wisconsin. I would, partly because I was rejected for admission <laughs> to this place um, uh, many decades ago. I, you know, I don't buy this Ivy League myth. Um, uh, I will uh, follow uh, Bruce's lead and, and introduce uh, the, the Nazi experience from another perspective. Many uh, of the officers, SS and otherwise, who c committed unspeakable atrocities had doctorates from the best German universities in the most re uh, refined aspects of culture. <laughs> uh, my, um, my argument is the other way. I think it's, 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 there's something wrong with some of the most advantaged uh, people in, in America not exposing themselves to the same risks and service as others. Uh, very few in the Congress uh, in 2003 who effectively rushed to, to authorize this abominable war in, in Iraq had themselves served or had a child in military service. There's something very deeply wrong with that. Is that an argument for the draft or for <laughs> ROTC? <laughs> Next question. Uh, well, the draft issue. Yeah, eventually, we, uh, we might return to the draft issue. Can I, can I just respond to your question? I think, again, you're confusing individuals and institutions. I have no objection. In fact, I'm strongly in favor of students with liberal arts education uh, becoming officers in the military. The question is, should the institutions be blended? Yes. Uh, I'm Doug Chalmers. I'm a political scientist, retired. Um, I, and uh, I'm glad I came right after that comment because I think the, the one issue, the only issue that I can see that to uh, inhibit the reintroduction of ROTC training for a Columbia students is a question of what institutional form will they take. I mean, I'm, the, the, the notion about Goldman Sachs running things uh, was cute, but it, it doesn't really, it isn't Goldman Sachs, it's the financial uh, in instruments and the financial organizations of the United States or of the world that are uh, that we and we do invite those in. They come in as as donors. They come in as, as with representatives. They do all kinds of things. There's an integration of the institutions, and certainly with the government, as uh, as Dick Betts was talking about. There's a lot of integration of the institutions, but. It might be the case, and this is really the question I have, and it's a more general question. I, I'm not sure who should, uh, who should I address it to. Uh, and that is, what would they be the institutional character of this? Uh, when I went, to, I went to MIT, and therefore I was in a, uh, I entered, I was a freshman at MIT, and therefore I had to go to ROTC because it's a land-grant school. And then I kept on it because I wanted to keep out of the Korean War. Um, as somebody else said. Uh, so I have some experience with uh, actually in three different universities, the ROTC program. And as far as I could tell, the ROTC program was in a, you know, it was a separate building over there. And this was the University of Illinois, MIT, and then at Bowdoin College. And it, it had nothing, it didn't, it wasn't a, a, an institution built into the, uh, 
uh, into the university framework in any sense that implied anything bad about it. But it could be, and I think the, I, the only thing I hear is a, a casual references to the fact that, well, there's an issue about whether the army would have control over granting professorships. And that, that would seem to me to be, a, that, that, that would absolutely uh, kill, the, uh, uh, kill the, the, the uh, proposal as far as I'm concerned. But I was wondering whether, is there any more sense as to what the, what the actual institutional position would be here at Columbia University? I raised this question with Professor Applebaum, who I've seen is uh, in the back of the room. Uh, perhaps you can uh, respond. Uh, yeah, the the institutional the uh, the issues that uh, caused Columbia and the United States Navy to part company in 1969 were academic issues. They involved uh, the fact that the Navy was teaching ROTC courses that were accepted for Columbia degree credit, and the curriculum was in, was under the control of the Navy. That uh, naval officers were appointed as ex officio members of the Columbia faculty, and that the Navy was essentially controlling Columbia space. Uh, these were the things that were addressed by the Mansfield Committee. And the Mansfield Committee concluded that if Naval ROTC were to continue at Columbia in 1969, that all of these would have to be regularized. The United States Navy found these conditions intolerable, and the ROTC arrangement was terminated. Uh, what is not generally known is, is that the conditions that were found intolerable at Columbia were found workable in other places, most notably Princeton and MIT, and also Penn, Cornell, and some of our, our, our other peers. Uh, and it is the maintenance of these conditions which have formed the basis of all reconsiderations of our OTC at Columbia. The, the, the question of whether to award or deny uh, degree credit for any ROTC course will remain at the, with the deans, the faculties, and the committees on instruction of the relevant schools. Faculty appointments will be under Columbia, Columbia control, and as well as physical space and other resources. So in fact, these are the institutions. Are the, essentially, this is what has been called as a Princeton or MIT model. And you know, we, we dug in our heels um, in 1969. We stopped, but nobody else did. And the issue, to some degree, has passed us by. And the Princeton, MIT, and other places have maintained these programs. And they work there. And it is on the basis of those programs that we're considering. Thanks. Thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm Ted Grasky, and I'm spokesperson for the Columbia Alliance for ROTC which is a support group for ROTC. Uh, I'm going to branch off a little bit based on some of the uh, dialogue this morning because there seem to be issues on education, on the government, on the military. And I just want to add some information that after a 30-year association with the military is very factual. First, there are really two stages in an officer's education. The first is the, what you see in the ROTC. That is the young second lieutenant or ensign. It's very technical. And it's socializing. You have to learn the culture, as the culture was mentioned before. It is also, in the current ROTC programs, heavily infused with ethics and leadership, especially in the first two years of the program. The second phase is for what is referred to as the commander or the lieutenant colonel or colonel rank, or as we ex-military people say, the O5s and the O6s. Pay grades count. That is a whole different socialization and intellectual process, as evidenced by 34% of active duty military officers have advanced degrees, 9% of the American population does, and I can give you the references if you need them. The services values critical thinking. Yes, there's a stage where the new officer has to do procedures to some extent by the book, or people get hurt, not too dissimilar than a young doctor on his first operation. So the point I'd like to address is the services value education. They value critical thinking. You should not stereotype based on your observation of a war movie and a second lieutenant. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good observation. Next. Hello, my name is Dr. Mildred, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Mildred Polner. I'm president of Cinema Verite International Inc. My doctorate is from Columbia University, and I've worked all over the world. I was sent by the United States government to work as an educational consultant after perestroika in, uh, in Siberia. Uh, 
I think that in a perfect world, it would be wonderful if we didn't have to have any wars or any armies, but I've been all over and I've seen it's a highly imperfect world and it's necessary to be prepared for that world. And so I personally think that our GIs or veterans or whoever you want to call it, and I'm from the old school, obviously, they deserve some kind of credit and they're getting practically nothing. Uh, I have written an article and published it about the importance of having veterans in the classroom. Uh, I would like to see more of that. And I have a, a statement. This is a statement, and it's not a question. But if one of you wants to answer it, fine. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. And then I'll ask each of the panelists to, uh, if, thank you. And I'll ask uh, each of the panelists to, uh, to spend 60 seconds um, saying whatever they wish to say. Last question. This is a very brief question, so maybe we'll have time for the other comment. Uh, although maybe the response will be long, I hope it is. Uh, it's kind of a joint question for Dr. Helfman and Dr. Betts. Um, <clears throat> I just, uh, my name's Jordan, by the way. Sorry, I'm a second year SEPA student. Uh, I would just like to ask the two of you uh, to attempt to sort of reconcile two interesting observations that, that you each made. Dr. Helfman, your observation that the military and the academy are two separate, valid, and important institutions with very different missions, uh, different, uh, different, different mandates, and that those, those mandates are basically diametrically opposed. And then Dr. Betts, that, <clears throat> that the military is an instrument among many of the federal government. And then you made the observation that, of course, the federal government is deeply present on Columbia's campus. So what I what I would like to ask the two of you to do is to sort of reconcile this challenge, and particularly Dr. Helfen, to address the, what, I, what I think is a fact that, uh, that Dr. Betts asserted, uh, and to try to determine what is distinctive about ROTC that makes it more antithetical to the academy than uh, both the federal government that is ROTC's, or that is the military's master, and uh, many other government agencies who uh, may or may not be uh, equally or less antithetical than the military is to the academy. Thanks. Uh, Professor Betts, would you like to start? And then we'll just come down the panel for final <laughs> remarks, or you can address this question as well. Uh, well, I think uh, David Helpan has a point uh, in the sense that as a practical matter, there aren't uh, many uh, precise analogs to uh, the ROTC program as a mechanism for facilitating the uh, entry of Columbia students into uh, professions or uh, different lines of, of work uh, in that it is a, a, a formalized uh, uh, program that's different from uh, the way that students go from Columbia to Goldman Sachs. Uh, but it seems to me that in effect, Columbia does the same thing to facilitate uh, students' uh, opportunities in other lines of work. I mentioned the business school. Uh, the analog to the business school would be a degree program uh, in uh, military operations uh, and strategy, which exists at some universities, especially in, in Britain, but uh, not uh, much in the, uni in the United States. Uh, so I would see that as the practical uh, reason for seeing a similarity, even though in, in strict organizational and institutional terms there is indeed a difference. Thank you. Um, Professor Helton. Yeah, my, my point keeps coming back to the institutional arrangement that's what is, is the basis of my objection. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with Columbia students being members of an ROTC program. I certainly have no problem with veterans uh, being at Columbia as students. In fact, I'm much in favor of that and having started here in general studies, uh, I, I think it's an excellent way to facilitate their reentry into uh, civilian life. However, we do not, while we accept money from the government for research, I do, the government does not say they own a piece of my lab. The business school accepts money from Goldman Sachs, but they don't own a piece of the, of the business school. And furthermore, they don't specify what curriculum should be done, what faculty should be teaching, and specify requirements for students that are outside the requirements set by the faculty, who, in my view, as President Eisenhower was corrected, or the university. Could I just mention, though, that I think both Alan and I and most people involved stipulate 
that indeed if ROTC were to be reestablished to Columbia, it would not be under conditions where any of those uh, uh, differences applied in terms of uh, s specifying curriculum and uh, degree requirements and faculty appointments and things of that sort. In other words, the, the military would not own a piece of Columbia. <laughs> Professor Silver. Um, I've also been heard the Eisenhower story um, uh, many times. Uh, and I'm told that the faculty member who objected, the general of the Art University, was the rabbi. It was a rabbi. It was Isidore Rabbi. Maybe that's who I heard it from. <laughs> <laughs> well, a remarkable man. Um, look, uh, in many ways, I, I mean, the university is not a democracy, and public opinion doesn't count. Uh, to, to put it in a very uh, and I speak as an old pollster, uh, and uh, uh, the faculty, I'll say it out loud, <laughs> the faculty is the university. And I actually am d d disturbed by the extent to which the faculty, qua faculty, is not involved in this. I don't think that the Senate is the, is the sovereign body in this matter. The faculty is the sovereign body in this matter. Uh, so in that respect, we couldn't agree more. Uh, and actually, uh, the way in which uh, uh, President Faust at Harvard, it seems, has completely leapt over the faculty to make this deal, the text of which is not yet public, by the way, is, uh, it doesn't do credit to my cause, which, is, uh, to, uh, which has been put to bring back ROTC. Well, you know, it takes two to tango. Uh, the fact is that there are, if I, uh, Professor Betts knows a lot more about this than uh, I will ever know, but there are significant elements in, quote, the military that want nothing to do with us on, on cultural grounds. <laughs> uh, and uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one, one of the good things, of, of the cultural goods, political goods that uh, I think would uh, 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 come out of, the, of what is mistakenly called ROTC returning, is that um, this kind of uh, a gap of mutual incomprehension uh, would be lessened, and I think that's a social good f for the country. The reason why I don't like the idea of, of the phraseology of ROTC uh, returning is that if ROTC in any form were to be set up here, it would be on our terms, on the terms that the military rejected in 1969. Our terms, not their terms. Uh, many of the objections, which I certainly share, uh, simply don't apply. There is a sense in which ROTC here would be, in many ways, an extracurricular activity. No credit, no professorships. The curriculum is in our hands. Uh, I don't deny for a moment that ROTC has uh, unique aspects, so, some of the organizational ones I've addressed. And I don't deny for a moment that the military is not equivalent to any other kind of public service. You know, they're quite distinctive in ways which we all have in mind. But I do think that it would not be the case of the military owning a piece of this university, which is an abhorrent idea. It would be on our terms. Thank you. Professor Robbins, you have the last word. Um, I think the United States should have an army. Um, I think we might need it one day in self-defense. My father served under Dwight uh, Eisenhower and um, was decorated. Um, there's something to be said about Eisenhower's parting speech about the military industrial complex in terms of whether the military is just a tool of civilian administration or not. I mean, why so many dollars are going away from other things and going into the military. I'm not sure tool quite, quite does it. But okay, self-defense. Um, there are no lines of landing craft attacking the Jersey Shore. How much of what the United States military has done can be conceived uh, in any plausible way as self-defense? We have gone out of our way uh, with some fairly uh, outlandish reasons to seek out people far away to fight with. 
That is what, on the whole, the United States military has been doing. It has not been uh, defending the United States on its shores. I, I don't think it's been defending the United States at all. And therefore, I have the kind of moral problem that um, I was trying to express. One more point. This speaks to the clash of missions and cultures between the military in general and Colombia, the independence of mind that I hope that we teach here, the independence of mind that I'm afraid cannot really be um, a major part of the military if indeed the military is, as Dick Betts was suggesting, just a tool that has to obey Washington. Um, how to say this? I admire Colin Powell a lot. I think Colin Power, Powell was a, a man of honor and decency. And if he had behaved in an honorable way when he addressed the United Nations, he would probably have been elected president. But his culture of social, socialization, the ethic he had learned about leadership was also an ethic of obedience to orders. And therefore, when the commander of chief said, lie to the United Nations and say that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, that's what he said and he helped get us into this war. And I'm afraid that's exactly how much latitude there is most of the time for somebody who tries to exercise independent thinking within the military. I want to thank all of our panelists, the Arnold Saltzman Institute for War and Peace Studies, and all of you for attending this interesting discussion. Thank you. <laughs>